All right. Welcome, everybody. It's good to have you this morning. Glad you're able to uh, participate today. And uh, we're going to uh, discuss a very important topic uh, that's going around. And, you know, everybody's got different, uh, different needs with this, different questions. So uh, let's reopen America. And that's, that's the idea today. And if you're going to do that, uh, what are the best practices to reopen your business smartly? And that's, that's the key thing we want to talk about today. So uh, glad you're able uh, to attend. And just a few uh, housekeeping things first. Uh, if you've never been on a, a webinar, uh, if you have a question, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, feel free to ask those questions. And what we'll do as we go through if someone is uh, asking a question that pertains to what we're talking about at the moment, I'll go ahead and ask that question so we can get it, uh, we can get it answered for you. And then uh, at the end, I'll open it right back up and we'll be able to uh, uh, offer group questions and answers as well. So feel free to ask those because uh, we, we've got uh, an expert today and, and that's the idea, to help you be able to do what we need to do uh, in the community when things really get ramped up so that we do uh, bring back employees uh, smartly. Um, we know that COVID-19 has changed our lives and it, it is definitely changing the workforce. And so, so what are the challenges? There are a lot of different challenges and that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, just think of the questions, just think of the things that's going to be different for you and for your uh, place of business uh, as well. So today, we have uh, Joni Winters, uh, Winters Law Firm. Uh, Joni uh, was a past uh, HR manager for a large company, and she's also now a uh, labor and employer, employment attorney. And we have her with, with, her, uh, with us today. And uh, so, again, have your questions, pay attention. And Joni, again, it is so good to have you with us today. And uh, help us understand, because uh, uh, you and I talked before, about your beginning to see the commercials. The commercials are coming on. Uh, did you contact COVID-19 in the workplace? So uh, educate us today. Uh, when we leave here today, let's, let's all have a plan and, and look forward to getting America back to work. Okay, thanks, Marty. I don't, I don't know that I can help with America, but I can certainly help with some segments of South Carolina. That's um, right. We're gonna put a, a PowerPoint up, if you'll just bear with me for a moment. And we're all learning these new methods of technology, right? That's right. Wonder if we'll ever meet in person again. All right, so bear with me while that loads. There we go. And we will. Okay, there we go. All right, so as, as Marty said, we're gonna talk today about reopening for business and uh, we've heard from CDC to the governor, everyone is saying, please be cautious with this. Please do not rush to reopen, uh, despite the fact we'd really like to, because um, it feels like we've been at this forever. My um, lawyer disclaimer is that this is a moving target. We have seen so many changes since this has all started for us in the U.S., and I will tell you, um, there are now four and a half, and I say a half because the other piece of legislation hasn't been passed yet, but there are four pieces of legislation that total about 8,000 pages just on COVID and stimulus packages and things like that. Um, I've read all four, I haven't read the half of one yet, but I've read all four pieces of legislation twice. Um, my husband teases me that I've probably read it more than the Congress that passed it, but I have to know those laws because you're going to ask me, you're going to ask me those questions and it's important to know. And they're significant to employers, those four pieces of legislation, but they are a moving target. So what we're talking about today um, is as of today. And if, if things change and they are subject to change, we'll make sure that, that Marty's got an update on that and can post it on his website or wherever um, he wants to put that. But understand, this is a moving target, and these, these things I'm about to tell you are subject to change. 
So let's look at um, the coronavirus pandemic. It feels like this has been forever. Um, I can't remember the last time I've hugged somebody other than my husband. Uh, and um, I'm originally from the North, but I've been down here for 25 years and I'm, I'm now a Southern hugger and I miss hugging people. <laughs> uh, but actually this has only been since March 13th. The governor declared a state of emergency on March 13th, um, even though it feels like it's been a much longer than that. Now the virus has been around longer than that. It uh, allegedly originated in Wuhan, China in October. So it's, it's been around longer for other countries, but for us it's been since uh, the beginning of this year. Since March, our governor has issued 25 executive orders, which is unprecedented. And we're gonna see more. He's already said this morning, he's probably going to reopen some additional businesses by the end of this week. Well, today's Thursday. So we're anticipating an, an announcement and another executive order any minute. Um, what we're gonna talk about today though is his most recent one, and that is to begin the reopening of South Carolina. Okay, I'm gonna start off with some myths and some facts. So the myths, this is no big deal. Well, we all know that's, that's not true. It is a big deal. People have died from this. Um, we seem like we've got it under control, but can we just reopen our doors? No, that's a myth. If we do that, I think we'll be right back to where we were at the beginning of March. So we have to be careful, particularly as employers, because as Marty alluded, um, there are some legal ramifications that we'll discuss. I keep hearing this conspiracy theory, somebody out there is making up these numbers. Um, I don't believe that's the case. Maybe some are, are inflated because maybe some doctors are being overly cautious. Um, me, I like overly cautious. Uh, it really beats being careless. And the fact that we'll be finished with this nonsense in June, first of all, it's not nonsense. And June, I don't think so. I think it'll be at least the fall by the time we can really get back to some sense of full normalcy. And let's look at the facts. We are certainly in unprecedented times. Who'd have thought, right? At Christmas time, we had no clue what we were coming up on in March. Facts, we're not just flinging open the doors. As employers, we're going to be very cautious. Um, if our business is to survive this, and it will survive, if we do this cautiously, if we worry about the health and safety of not just our employees, but our customers and clients, we worry about security. Um, I was on a call two days ago with some folks from Department of Employment and Workforce. They are literally as employees being threatened because people are frustrated, they're not getting their money, their unemployment checks are not coming quickly. And so people are frustrated. And so security is becoming an issue. Legal, we'll go into that. Some of the legal ramifications of all this are far reaching. And if the more you prepare, the better off you will be. Okay, so we're open for business. March, or excuse me, May the 3rd, the governor issued an executive order, number 2020-31, if you wanna look it up. Um, and that modified his original home or work order. He says, we can start to reopen cautiously. We have to start thinking this through though. Don't just open your doors. Are you really ready? Do you know what to expect? Think about the physical layout of your business. Does it allow you to open with social distancing? If not, you're gonna to have to make some modifications. Can you adequately protect the health of your employees? And remember there are laws that govern that. You are responsible for the health of your employee while they're in your workplace. Can you also protect the health of your customers? Are your customers gonna receive the same level of service that they did pre-virus? Are you gonna be able to return to a level of business and revenue to support your payroll burden? If you took a loan under the CARES Act, you wanna make sure that's the case because if you want that loan forgiven, you wanna be able to make sure you have paycheck protection. These are significant questions you need answers to before you unlock your doors. Okay, so in the, the governor's order, it, it's very similar to his um, home or work order. He's just asking for more caution. It's permitting the engagement of essential business, essential activities, or critical infrastructure operations. That's primarily government. Um, but the word caution is now in his order. Um, so essential business, what's an essential business? 
Um, it was defined in his former order. It's not defined in the new order. Many of us who felt they had an essential business gave our employees a letter to carry around in their car. I talked to a lot of law enforcement agencies, none of whom have stopped people, pulled them over and said, do you have your papers? Um, but we were being cautious as employers, okay? Um, the governor's new order allows hotels to start taking reservations beginning May 15th. Beaches were reopened the week prior to that. Um, and people are being policed on the beach. There are um, officers that are going up and down beaches making sure people are social distancing. Uh, and so those photographs that you see on uh, Facebook and on TV that shows thousands and thousands of people in Fort Lauderdale and San Diego and Hawaii, if you look at those pictures, all of the people in those pictures are all wearing the same clothes. It's the same picture. It's one beach. It's not all of the beaches it's purporting to be. Um, and the governor is being very, very cautious with that. Outdoor dining was announced, uh, I believe, the beginning of this week. Now, they do have a variety of restrictions that we'll run through very quickly. Um, so we're, we're seeing some changes. And again, we'll probably see some before the end of this week. Donnie, real quick uh, question here. Uh, clarification. We do have uh, some clients uh, and uh, from the state of North Carolina. So if you've got uh, some information to share uh, for that state as well, some tidbits, uh, that would be good as well. Okay. Thank you, Marty. And I, I will, to those folks who are from North Carolina, I love um, my now home state of, of South Carolina, but North Carolina is to be applauded because they actually did a lot of this before South Carolina. They were very progressive in their shutdown, very progressive in their reopening. And I, I will tell you, their, their restaurant restrictions are four pages long. Um, so they're being ultra cautious. Um, and I will try to hit on that as best I can. So beginning on, on May the 4th, outdoor dining was permitted in South Carolina with restrictions. A lot of restaurants, I was on a call with the South Carolina Restaurant and Leisure Association last week, and um, they were, the owners were very concerned because they lost a very big day for them, and that was Easter. And they were very, very hoping that they would not lose Mother's Day, another big event for a small restaurant or even a big restaurant. And so when the announcement came, they were very, very excited that they could at least do outdoor dining. If you went over this past weekend to try to find a picnic table anywhere in the state, you couldn't find one because most of the restaurants were clamoring to buy as many picnic tables as they could to create outdoor dining if they didn't already have it. Um, it's just an opportunity that they didn't want to miss. Any restaurant that is open for outdoor dining without following the restrictions I'm about to give you will be shut down immediately. Governor um, McMaster has given the authority to local law enforcement to do that. So our tables are restricted to eight patrons. North Carolina, I believe it's restricted to six. Um, in both states, every table, chair, everything has to be sanitized after each use. So there's going to be a wait for tables because there's going to be um, a transition time with cleanup. Staff has to use caution approaching and working with patrons, so they have to keep social distance between themselves and the patron, and they have to keep patrons at a social distance. Um, if any of you have been to a restaurant like um, Longhorn or Outback, many of the, the workers in there are college students. Imagine college students having to keep patrons at a social distance. It's a huge burden for these kids, um, but it is part of the restriction. If any worker exhibits signs, and this, this is across the board, not just for restaurants, but any worker who has signs of fever over 100.4, cough or shortness of breath, the employer must send that worker home and prohibit them from coming back to work. The rule is we, they have to self-isolate after that for seven days and end the isolation for at least seven days after the onset of the symptoms the employee has to be fever free and or symptom free for three consecutive days without medication, making them symptom free or fever free before returning to work. And I have a little chart that I'll share with you that'll walk through that. Um, but this is for outdoor dining. Okay, so what about getting our other employees back to work? 
um, this is going to present some challenges. <laughs> First, um, we were permitted to send the employees home, put them on unemployment. Our state unemployment system um, in North Carolina, I believe yours was the same way, state unemployment system said we're going to waive the first week, so there's no waiting week, and we're going to waive the requirement to go look for a job. And so all that being said, when we put our employees out on furlough or workers' comp and they went and applied for unemployment, they were almost immediately granted benefits if they could get through. Um, I know that there have been nightmare stories about trying to get through with unemployment. Um, I have a client who literally gets up at two in the morning to get online with unemployment to file claims because it's the only time he can get on. So our, our folks have gotten the benefits. Maximum benefit in South Carolina is 326. Uh, North Carolina, I'm not sure what yours is, but that's the state benefit. On top of that, there's a federal benefit that's been granted of $600 through the end of July. So we have employees who are on unemployment or furlough who are making $926 a week. For some, that's more than they've, they make when they come to work for us. So getting them back is going to be a little tough. I frankly am not sure I would come back to work if I'm making that kind of money. Um, it's very tempting. I can sit out through the end of summer and make a lot of money. Keep in mind that state maximums change. So for example, the state or the Commonwealth of, of Massachusetts, their maximum is $823. So with the federal supplement, that's $1,423 a week. And so we're gonna have a challenge having folks come back. If they refuse after a reasonable notice, so we, we call the employee and say, hey, the furlough was, was until the end of May, but we're ready to reopen. And so we'd like you to come back on May the 15th. So hopefully our policy says that we would have a notice period of two weeks before we bring you back. Um, and that employee refuses to return. That worker can be separated. In other words, temp uh, terminated. And will likely be, be disqualified from any further unemployment benefits. So if the plan is to sit out the summer, that's going to backfire on that employee. So as a business, what do we do when we recall them? Do we threaten the employee with, well, that's fine, but your employment, your unemployment's gonna be cut off. You can say that, it's factual. Um, it's a little harsh, and it's certainly going to destroy the relationship with that employee. Um, I've got some employers who are creating an incentive pay through the end of July, which is when the federal supplement ends. Um, that's a business decision, how you decide to bring your folks back. Understand what precedents you're going to set, regardless of which way you go. If you give an incentive pay, please, please, please do not call it hazard pay. If you call this hazard pay, you have just now declared COVID-19 a hazard for your company. Yes, it's a national pandemic, it's an international pandemic, but don't call it a hazard because now you've got OSHA issues. So just call it COVID pay or back to work pay, whatever you wanna call it, hero pay. I've got some clients that are calling it that. Um, for the employee who says, well, I'm not comfortable coming back, I'm scared. That's not an acceptable reason not to return either. As long as you, the employer, are following your CDC and OSHA guidelines to keep your workplace safe, that's not an acceptable reason not to come back. Um, if you, the employer, are not following those guidelines, that's a different story. Also, if your employee's reasoning is medically related, now we have to work with that employee through the interactive process of ADA to see if we can make an accommodation. And at all times, you can get um, documentation from medical personnel on this. It's not just because. If you've had employees working at home, and this is going to be another challenge for many of you, and that employee had childcare issues, but you made it easy because the employee could telework, and that worked out for everyone because schools were closed. But now that you're reopening and you're saying to that employee, um, I need you to come back, and they say, well, I don't want to come back, um, you will probably see an uptick in FMLA claims because as you all know, the, the Families First Act provided FMLA time for employees who lost childcare. And so you'll wanna become familiar with that. Um, I, we've created a, a form in our law firm. I'm happy to share it with anybody who wants it. I can share it with Marty so he can share it with his clients. 
um, to have employees complete a form for that FMLA leave, which gives them two weeks of paid leave under Families First and under the amendment of FMLA. And that's available until October. So I suspect you're going to have some employees who are being called back, still have childcare issues, and are going to try to apply for that time. The CDC has identified some high-risk employees, and you're going to have to be aware of these because these are folks that have to be treated differently. So some serious um, underlying conditions, and I'll tell you, the, the first one is older employees, 65 plus. Um, I, I personally would object to that categorization because I'll be, I'll be that older employee come October. I always think of older employees as 80, um, but apparently um, I'm in that category soon. And then we've got employees with serious underlying health conditions. These are defined as high blood pressure, chronic lung disease, asthma, serious heart condition, diabetes, severe obesity with, with a BMI of 40 plus, a compromised immune system, chronic kidney or liver disease. All of those are underlying health conditions that are considered to be serious. One thing I would recommend, and you can do this, um, EEOC has sort of put their stamp of approval on it. You can consider a voluntary self-certification self process. So you ask the employee to identify if they're in a high risk category, and if so, are they seeking an accommodation? So we ask employees who fall into that category to complete a self-certification. You're only gonna ask the employees to turn this form in if they're seeking an accommodation. So you're not gonna violate any privacy laws or anything like that. And as far as HIPAA is concerned, you're gonna make sure that that form goes only to your, um, your health officer, your, your um, HIPAA privacy officer. And that HIPAA privacy officer is probably going to take on a new role. Now you are the COVID officer. And so that form goes there, so we're not violating HIPAA stays there, gets filed in a different place, not the employee's file. Um, but you may want to consider looking at the accommodation requests because um, you do have some high risk folks in your operation. If you can have people telework, continue to telework, and that's possible and feasible with your business ops, you want to, you want to try to accommodate that. Um, be very careful. Um, allowing these high-risk employees to return to work if they choose to avoid claims of age or dis disability discrimination. We're, we're going to see a lot of that, unfortunately. Um, if we mandate high-risk employees to come back, we're going to have to look for guidance for uh, our governor, the CDC, and OSHA, um, because it all falls into that. Understand that pregnancy in general is not, is not high-risk unless the doctor classifies it as such. There are some pregnancies that um, are high risk, where you've got someone with gestational diabetes, things like that, um, but you'll want medical certification of that, and you are absolutely within your rights to ask for that medical certification if an employee is seeking such a, a, an accommodation because of pregnancy. Pregnancy alone is not high risk. Okay, so what are some things that you can do to mitigate your damages? You can do the questionnaires, as I recommended, um, and you can ask that this be done upon re-entry of your employees, but remember ADA and HIPAA, be careful with those, those documents. The EEOC has also stated that we can require temp testing on employees if, if they're coming back into the workplace. Um, I've got a client who temp tests at the time clock when they're clocking in, temp tests when they're clocking out. I think that's a little overkill, but um, they're probably only going to do it for the first week of return, and then they're just going to do temp testing when, they come, when the employee comes to work. Um, and so you'll definitely wanna do temp testing if you've got employees that have symptoms. Think it through, have a policy, because otherwise we're going to have issues. Who's gonna be your temp taker? Um, I, if I'm in HR, I wouldn't want to do that job. I'm not a medical professor, professional. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, it should be a medical professional. What type of protective gear is that temp taker wearing? Gloves, masks, what are they wearing? Is it an employee? Can you have them sign an acknowledgement or a waiver? I'm going to tell you that the answer to that is no. 
you cannot waive workers' comp rights. And so there's no acknowledgement, no waiver that's really legal that you can have your temp take or take, all right? Um, when tested, you should have your employees six feet apart. Remember the CDC social distancing. If your employees are required to wait in line to get tested, they have to be paid for that time while they're standing in line. And so it would be after they clock in or after they sign in their timesheet. As an employer, you can require the wearing of a mask. Neither North Carolina or South Carolina would have a requirement of, of masks, but you as the employer can do this. But keep in mind, you've got some caveats on that. Um, I can tell you I've seen people with masks on. Uh, I, I literally saw a woman at Walmart, and if anybody on the call is from Chester, you'll, you'll, you have seen this because it's circulated like wildfire around Chester. Um, she took a, a toddler's pull-up and pulled it over her face, and that was her mask. <laughs> okay? So people are getting kind of crazy creative with masks. There are masks that work, and then there are masks that don't. If you're requiring masks, make sure they're the ones that work. Um, otherwise, you're going to get sued. Understand that you, if you require masks, just like any other PPE, you have to provide the masks. Um, and keep in mind workers' comp in the back of your head and OSHA, which we'll talk about in a couple minutes. If the masks have to be cleaned, if they can be cleaned and, and they're really the best ones, um, if you require the employee to take care of that, you don't have to pay them to do that. They may say you do, but you, you don't. Um, but they do have to be cleaned and you should have some educational provision on how they should be cleaned, how to wear them. Um, I routinely see people wearing masks and they're constantly touching the mask. The CDC has said, don't touch your face, stop it. And so I see people, they've got gloves and they've got masks and they're constantly touching their face, they're moving it. I saw a woman come out of Publix the other day. She took her mask off and gave it to her husband and he put it on. Don't share masks, okay? So you have to educate your employees on, on all of this. If you're using the 95 masks, understand that they are regulated by OSHA. If you don't understand the OSHA regulations on those masks, get familiar with it. There has to, do, has to be a fit test done and all sorts of other things. They are OSHA regulated. If your employee refuses to wear the mask and you've required them, you've sent out a memorandum or however you've um, notified your employees, that's a condition of employment. Just like steel-toed shoes or, or safety glasses, the employee can be suspended and or terminated if they continue to, to refuse. Make sure, however, they're not protesting the wearing of that mask because of a medical condition. Um, because then again, we've got ADA issues that are gonna have to be accommodated. On April 23rd, the EEOC gave us additional guidance that said the Americans with Disabilities requires that any mandatory medical test of employees be job related and consistent with business necessity. Well, we can certainly make that argument bringing our, our folks back. But what about after that? If you decide that you have an employee who creates a direct threat to others, you can COVID-19 test them. You have that right because you are responsible for the health and safety of the remainder of your workforce, okay? Make sure your tests are reliable and accurate. I don't know how you're gonna do that. Uh, there are some that have been proven to be accurate and reliable. Stay with them, with those. Um, those that have a track record are, are gonna be the best bet for you. And as best you can, still require social distancing, regular hand washing, um, all of those things. It, it's really an educational thing if you've got a safety director or safety manager, this would fall onto your safety director to, to get this training done for people before they actually sit at their workstation and start to work. Donnie, we've got a, a quick question that's uh, sure. specific to an industry. Uh, Cindy says, can we require an older employee, employee to have a note from a doctor saying it's okay for her to come to work at our child care center? Does everybody have to have a note or just the older employee? Cindy, if you can just, just uh, take uh, that response in and, and uh, we'll let Joni kind of uh, expound on that. Here's my thought, Marty, and I'll, I'll try to answer it just assuming. Um, so if, if everybody gets that letter, 
then we're not singling that employee out. If we're singling that employee out, is it because they have said, I'm in a, um, I'm in a high risk category and I need an accommodation? That employee is not asking for an accommodation. Um, we don't have the, the requirement to proffer it without the request. But um, I think I would ask the employee, can you get something from your physician that says you're high risk um, and here are some precautions that we need to take for you in, in the best interest of the employee? Because if the employee is high risk, you know, I'm, I'll tell you, I'm, like I said, I'll be 65 in October. I don't consider myself high risk. I go two different places here and home, my office and home. I'm not high risk, but I'm in the high risk category. So just because one is in the category doesn't mean they are high risk. Does that make sense? Yeah, that was, that was the question because that employee falls in that, that risk category and they were just talking about her. Sure. Yeah. I, th I think I would wait for the employee to self-identify, self-certify and say, Hey, I need some accommodation. And if, and if she comes back with additional questions, Marty, just interrupt me. Okay. Okay. So we're going to need to look at our policies. Um, one policy I would not do anything with right now is your family and medical leave. Um, I mentioned it earlier. It's been amended. Um, it's a temporary amendment so far. Now, Congress may change their mind. They may come back and say, any loss of child care going forward, um, we're going to allow this policy to stay in place. But that's not going to happen until October or September. So don't rush to change that policy yet. But your safety policies are going to need a really deep dive. You've got lots of issues that pertain to safety. Um, if you're requiring certain PPE regarding COVID, it's likely your policy doesn't state that now. So you want to tweak that. You want to have in your safety policy when and how the company's going to COVID test, what the consequences are if you test positive, what are the requirements for wiping down work areas, things like that. So your safety policy is going to have to really be torn apart and rewritten. If you're allowing teleworking, which many employers are saying that they're not going to continue, they're going to stop it. Um, what are the rules on teleworking? What about workers' comp? Um, teleworking, if you took a loan or a grant under the CARES Act and you've got people teleworking, you're going to want really good time records in order to be, to be able to get your loan forgiven. And so if your folks haven't been doing time records, get them started if they continue to telework. You will need those documents. Um, employees should also be cross-trained in case we have another pandemic. Uh, who would have thought that this was going to happen to America? But it has, and so it could happen again. And if we have to furlough employees in the future or they have to stay home because of childcare issues, let's get folks cross-trained so that in the absence of one employee, we can stagger employees and know that we've got um, folks that have the skill sets we need to get the job done. You're gonna need a policy um, and you don't have to call it coronavirus, but it should be for infectious disease if you don't already have one. How are you gonna handle infectious disease going forward? It is not unlikely that this won't happen again. Okay, so prepare for it now. We're all gonna learn stuff from this. Um, your benefits policies are going to need tweaking, and, and that's where Marty's going to come into play and, and his group. Um, while it do, you know, any kind of tweaking you do to your benefits doesn't have to be in your handbook, but it should be in your summary plan document. So, for example, you have an employee who lost their benefits eligibility because they're no longer full-time based on reduced hours. We need to determine when and how that employee can re-enter your benefits plan. If the employee returns from a furlough after less than a 13 week absence, during which they weren't in your health plan, we have to immediately reinstate them on the plan in compliance with Affordable Care Act. So all those things have to come into play. And for all your other benefits, what do you have to do to get your employee back into those benefits? Again, um, Marty's the guy, you need to call him, get up with him, make sure all that's under control before you bring people back. Um, your return to work policy should also be in line with all the reasons now that an employee could be out of work. We're going to have to add infectious diseases that create a furlough. It's a new day. Um, you should have a standard notification period for the employee as to when they can return. So if our furlough was at the end of May, 
we're going to give you 36 hours telling you we're ending the furlough early and that should be in your return to work and again uh, don't do anything with your FMLA let's see what happens okay so this is the chart I referred to earlier I think um, this this might answer a lot of your questions so um, when do we bring people back so we've got somebody with fever and a cough but no confirmed COVID they fully recovered from whatever it was they had. So they can return to work if three days have passed since their recovery with no fever for a minimum of 72 hours. And that no fever caveat has to be without Advil and any kind of medication to get your fever down. It has to be a normal decrease of fever, 72 hours, no respiratory symptoms, and seven days have passed since they had whatever their illness was. Okay, so three days passed with recovery, no fever for 72 hours, and seven days since original symptoms. Number two, we've got somebody who's confirmed COVID, but no illness. They can return to work seven days since their first positive test. They haven't become ill. Um, an additional three days after the end, their isolation, they have to continue social distancing, which we're all gonna do anyway they have to wear a mask or any kind of covering of their nose and mouth okay so their restrictions not quite that bad they can return to work seven days after the test um, and then three days after they have to be careful number three confirmed and mildly or moderately ill so not hospitalized so this employee has self-isolated and medicated at home they haven't gone into the hospital they can return to work after three days have passed since their recovery, no abnormal fever, much like number one, after 72 hours with no medication, no respiratory symptoms, no continued illness, no signs of COVID, right? And this is, this is important. The employee has had two confirmed negative COVID-19 tests that have been administered by a medical professional 24 hours apart. That's important. <clears throat> confirmed hospitalized, um, here's your high risk. This is, this is not so easy, this is not so clear. Um, the CDC recommends on these folks rigorous testing, rigorous, before returning them to work since they could, they could experience longer periods of viral detection, meaning it's in their system and it's gonna be harder to detect. And so they might get a negative test, but then two days later they may get a positive. So these are your folks that are gonna be tricky. <clears throat> Um, these employees should be discussing return to work with their health care provider. And I, I mean this respectfully to the employers online, but you aren't the end line on this. Their health care provider is. Once their health care provider can give a green light, then you're going to look at this employee much as you would look at number three employee. You're going to want two negative tests in a 24 hour period. Okay. And if they're in a higher risk area, this is your senior citizen who's 80 years old and has uh, had COVID in the hospital, um, that's gonna be tricky. That's, that's where you're probably gonna wanna talk to your, your corporate counsel. There is a, a quick question. It says, okay. uh, does the 72 hour rule, staying home after a fever, also apply to children sent home from childcare with a fever? Um, I, that's a great question, and I will tell you, Marty, that the law does not distinguish age. Okay, it doesn't. It doesn't distinguish age. So I would say yes. Um, and and many childcare centers and schools have their own rules on that, and they're usually over cautious. So they may even say no, it's more than seventy two hours. But the law says seventy two hours and does not make a distinction on age. It just says individuals. So great question. Okay, so let's look at the legal side. Um, and, and I assure you, this, this is going to be a problem. Um, first of all, we have OSHA. And I think everybody kind of forgets about OSHA because if you're not in manufacturing, most of us believe OSHA doesn't apply. It does. As an employer, we have a legal obligation under the general duty clause of OSHA to provide a place of employment that's free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm. 
and COVID-19 falls squarely under that. So we have an obligation to make sure our employees are safe when they return. And so I said earlier that an employee can refuse to return without, and you can terminate them. Here's an area where they can refuse to return. So if the employee believes that your working conditions are unsafe or unhealthy, they should come to you first and give you the opportunity to cure. They are not required to do that. They can go directly to OSHA and file a complaint under general duty clause. Um, if the condition clearly represents significant risk and OSHA doesn't have enough time to get in there and inspect, and inspect um, the employee has a legal right to refuse to come to work where they would be exposed. Um, I doubt that anybody on this, this um, Zoom is, is in that category where you're not, you're, you're not worrying about safety and health, but um, understand if we're not taking precautions, it could be a, an OSHA claim. And if you ever had OSHA on your doorstep, um, they're not nice. OSHA does have a retaliation clause. So if we have someone who does file a complaint, we cannot take adverse employment action against them. Um, OSHA has issued guidelines. Everybody's issuing guidelines these days. Um, and they have said, what we're looking for is just good faith efforts because this is all so unprecedented. No one knows what to do. And so if we see good faith efforts to comply with this general duty clause, we're good with that. And so as of on, on 423, so that's a couple weeks ago, OSHA had 2,400 complaints. So they're out there. This is not, uh, we think this will happen. This is happening. So they had 2,400 complaints that were strictly relative to COVID-19. They closed out 1,400 of them, but that still leaves 1,000. And if you're one of those thousand employees or employers rather, you're dealing with that. As of yesterday, the complaints to OSHA relative to COVID-19 were just short of 7,500. So when I tell you these complaints are out there, they are out there. Um, we've already discussed Americans with disabilities. Remember that that plays into this and don't discount someone's um, request for accommodation because if it falls under ADA and you dismiss it, you'll have an ADA claim. Workers' comp, as, as Marty said in the beginning, uh, over the weekend I saw my first commercial for a plaintiff's attorney office that said, if you've been exposed to COVID-19, call us, we can get you money. And I thought, oh no, already? Um, so my concern is we're gonna have a rash for these claims. Um, so if you're taking precautions, you are documenting things, someone starts to cough and sneeze, do the right thing, send them home, do not dismiss anything and make sure you're keeping your workplace clean. You keep all that, that going and these workers' comp claims can be denied, but we're gonna have to be prepared for that. Discrimination, uh, you know, anytime we make a decision about our workforce, this is a, a consideration and a challenge. And somebody's already raised the question about age, um, we're going to have to worry about that. Um, so have some internal criteria to determine who you're going to recall. Identify the skill sets, the necessities. Why are you calling this person back, but you're not calling this person back? I saw in the newspaper this morning that a lot of temporary furloughs are now becoming permanent layoffs. If you're heading in that direction, make sure, create a spreadsheet and figure out why are you bringing Bob back and you're not bringing Joe back. And Joe happens to be an a 72 year old African American male and Bob is um, 40 and white, you may have to justify that. You may have to argue why you brought one over the other. So keep all your, your records straight. And if you don't need to use them, hooray for you. But um, use as much objective criteria as you can, maybe last in, first out. That doesn't always work because of the job you're bringing back. Um, I would encourage you to work with your legal counsel to make sure you're not creating a disparate impact. And if you lay somebody off permanently, consider some kind of release with caveats on um, age discrimination and Older Workers Benefit Protection Act. But again, have those lists of folks. And for those of you, if you're in manufacturing and you have a point system, um, that's probably been a challenge for you already. And so, continue with that challenge. Make sure that you're not discriminating based on your point system 
make sure you're consistent across across the board. This is all going to be a very big challenge for us when the dust settles. We're all hoping for the dust to settle soon. Um, this is the dust that that I'm thinking isn't going to settle very soon. All right, Johnny, we got one other question before I forget. Seth says, um, "How Seth? long?" How long does an employee who has no symptoms but has been exposed to someone who has tested positive have to stay out of work? Okay, so they've had exposure, but they've not tested positive. So um, that, that really is, so they're not confirmed. Have they been tested? Let's assume they've been tested. So they really are, they should look at three days since they've been exposed. Um, no, strike that, Marty, I'm sorry. Seven days, I'm reading the, my wrong notes. Seven days since their exposure, and during that seven day period, they should have no fever for 72 hours without you know, any kind of medication. So you got seven days of self-isolation from exposure. Now, a physician may see that differently because of the overall health of the individual. Now, that's a CDC recommendation, what I just read to you. A physician may say, you know, you're an athlete, you run four times a week, uh, you're, you're, you're just in great health. And so they may say, no, three days is enough. But the, the key to all of that really is the three days of no temp. And everybody, when this all started, everybody was worried about getting notes from doctors for people to be out of work. If I'm an employer, which I am, uh, my concern is not that, that note that writes the employee out of work, it's the note that brings them back. I want a note from a physician that says, this employee is ready to come back and able to come back. That to me is the most important note. And um, Seth can, can require that, absolutely. Bring a note back that you're free and clear to come back. Okay, um, so don't forget Fair Labor Standards Act. If you've had folks that are remote working, make sure they've maintained time records. Um, if you've got folks that are on quarantine, if you've got exempt employees and they're working from home and they worked one hour, you've got to pay them for the week. Don't forget about Fair Labor Standards Act in all of this chaos. Um, we're all scrambling to worry about uh, FMLA and ADA and all of that. Uh, Fair Labor Standards Act is still in place. Nobody um, suspended it. It's still there. So make sure your employees are getting paid properly. Okay, and, and so what do we do about all this? Um, any of you on the call know how I feel about documentation. If you're not documenting for potential legal claims, if you're not documenting potential workers' comp claims, OSHA violation claims, and reimbursement claims, remember you're going to get some of your money back that you're spending on COVID-19 extra things. You're buying gloves, you're buying masks, you're buying disinfectant. We don't know just yet how Congress is going to reimburse all of this. I don't know that Congress knows that yet, but be prepared. Um, get every penny back that you can that you've had to spend on this crisis. I think it's very, very important. Um, and it certainly will help with those potential legal claims. Do you have any more questions, Marty? That before I'm on the next to the last slide, so I don't want to mm. miss any. Um, okay, well, it's time you said that. Uh, where can we find a copy of the law that you reference regarding the 72-hour rule? We want to be able to quote it in our parent handbook. Um, that's easy. Go on to the CDC website. And they have a ton of COVID-19 information on there. That is under their guidelines. That is, it, it's not a law, it's a CDC guideline. Um, so it's really not a law, but um, our governor has adopted the CDC guidelines in uh, one of his executive orders. So while it's not a law, it's in South Carolina, it's an executive order. So we have to follow it, but you'll, you can find it on CDC website. Okay. That's it at the moment. Okay. <clears throat> and then, so just to wrap up, um, we just have a final word from Sam and you have to listen carefully to what he's saying. Everybody get out of your homes and fight the coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
Okay, so Sam says, everybody get out of your homes and fight the coronavirus. Everybody be careful, be cautious. Um, we'll get through this. And those employers who have been smart throughout the whole month and a half we've been dealing with this and cautious, uh, we'll be just fine. We will be just fine. Um, however, we're approaching the, you know, the, I, I hate this phrase, but we are approaching the new norm. Nobody knows what that is yet. And so we're establishing the new norm as we reopen. And hopefully um, it will go well for you. Uh, I know I'm, I'm certainly available for anybody if, if you have questions after this. Um, Marty is, is the guy on, on benefits. He's, he'll get you through that. He will navigate you through a lot of this and, and benefits are going to be key for all of this. And that, right. that concludes. All right. Well, good deal. Well, this is your time. I currently don't have any questions outstanding. If anybody has any questions, uh, type those in real quick and, um, and I'll go back and check here in a minute. Uh, what I will also do is I will email uh, everyone and um, um, the contact info for, uh, I'm trying to share some information if I can pull it up real quick. Uh, of uh, Joni and myself, if, if we can help you in any way, uh, here's our contact information that should pop up here. Inside. There you go. Here's our contact information. Definitely, as you see, there's a, a lot of information. There are a lot of general questions. And when we hang up, uh, things may come to mind. If you need Joni's assistance, uh, she, again, it's Winter's Law Firm. Uh, she, that's what she's there for. If you need to bring her on as a consultant, uh, there's her information. Uh, below. Uh, again, if we can help you as well, there's our, our office number as well. Uh, does anybody, if I can get my mouse to cooperate, does anybody have any questions at the moment? Let's see if anybody has. I don't see any additional questions. All right, let me double check one quick time. All right, there's uh, no additional questions at the moment. Again, thank you all for attending. I will post this and send a link just in case you want to see it again. And or somebody you know may need to see it, we'll definitely have this posted for you. Again, thanks a lot. Uh, hope you were able to learn something. And until next time, uh, we'll see you then. Y'all have a good day. Take care. Thanks, Joni.